Welcome all of you to this live program on Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Garrett Sobel from New Jersey, United States. Dr. Sobel is a fellowship trained orthopedic surgeon at the Advanced Orthopedic and Sports Medicine Institute in New Jersey, United States. Dr. Sobel completed his undergraduate degree at the University of Pennsylvania, where he graduated summa cum laude. He received his medical degree from the Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia, where Dr. Sobel graduated in the top 10% of the class and was inducted into the prestigious Alpha Omega Alpha Honor Society. Dr. Sobel completed his orthopedic surgery residency at Rutgers University Hospital in Nevada, New Jersey, and went on to complete his sports medicine fellowship at the Northwestern University in Chicago, Illinois. During this time, Dr. Sobel published numerous articles in multiple high impact orthopedic journals. So today it's my great honor to introduce you to Dr. Garrett Sobel from New Jersey, United States. Over to Garrett. Thanks, Tesh. I appreciate that. Uh... Nice introduction. Um, so as you said, uh, my name is Garrett Sobel. I'm uh, an orthopedic surgeon with a focus on sports medicine in uh, New Jersey uh, in the United States. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you today about distal biceps ruptures and their management. So to jump right in. Um, so we'll start with the basics. Uh, epidemiology, who do we typically see these, uh, these injuries in? Uh, they're relatively uncommon compared to their counterpart in the uh, long head of the biceps and the shoulder. That's much more common. Uh, distal biceps injuries only represent about 10% of total ruptures, and they tend to be in the dominant elbow of males in their 40s and 50s. Uh, the mechanism is usually a single event. Uh, the elbow is flexed. There's an unexpected extension uh, load, eccentric contraction of the biceps, and a painful pop. Uh, very often, patients will describe uh, maybe they're carrying something heavy like this couch uh, with their uh, with their friend, and the other person either let it down suddenly or dropped it, and that's when these these injuries tend to occur. Um, and it all kind of goes back to this uh, muscle force velocity curve. If you were to look at this kind of on a, a basic science level, the left side of that curve is the contractile velocity being negative, meaning the muscle is extending. So it's contracting to prevent extension, which is eccentric contraction. And that's when the muscle force is the highest. And that is when uh, typically this distal biceps ruptures, but really when any tendon rupture tends to occur. So as far as why did this, does this happen, um, there's been some, some uh, research into some proposed mechanisms. Um, this article came out in 1995 and proposed possibly two uh, etiologies for distal biceps tendon ruptures, one being impingement, and they showed that the radial ulnar distance uh, in pronation versus supination at the level of the bicipital tuberosity is much less in pronation. Uh, so the thought was that, you know, potentially as people with repetitive pronation supination uh, motions in their arm, they might uh, cause attritional ruptures of the distal biceps. Uh, here's just a graph kind of demonstrating the distance between uh, the two in both supination neutral as well as pronation. Uh, another proposed uh, mechanism uh, for the pathogenesis is hypovascularity of the biceps. Uh, they looked at three different zones of blood flow to the distal biceps tendon region, the zone two being just proximal to the insertion site which is in practice where you tend to see these uh, biceps tendon injuries happening uh, and they leave a small stump of tendon behind. So that zone two is a watershed area. It's relatively hypovascular to the surrounding area, uh, which may be prone to attrition and rupture. Again, uh, this is just a, just a hypothesis. And it all goes back to the thought that perhaps uh, a tendon that's totally normal, you know, wouldn't rupture outside of some uh, large trauma or, uh, or a sharp uh, penetrating event. Risk factors for distal biceps tendon injuries, these have been described uh, for quite some time. Smoking being probably the largest one. Uh, any patient that comes in, you really gotta, you gotta ask them about that. Um, anabolic steroid use, uh, if you look like this guy, um, you have a much higher chance of tearing your distal biceps, um, as well as if you're, if you're a male. Uh, really actually until recently, it was pretty unheard of um, for females to tear their distal biceps. At this point, it, it's almost case reportable for that to, to happen. So it's, it's a very rare event. Almost everybody is, is male gender. Uh, going into the anatomy a little bit here, the flexors of the elbow. Um, contrary to a lot of popular belief, the biceps is actually not the most powerful flexor of the elbow. That, that honor is the brachialis. Um, However, which is really just a flexor, it doesn't contribute to the supination and pronation, whereas the biceps is, is um, much more significant with that. Um, when you have your elbow in full supination, however, the biceps does take on a much larger role. 
Um, the brachioradialis is more important for elbow flexion and pronation. And uh, for anyone who goes to the gym, I mean, that's the difference between doing, say, a conventional biceps curl versus a, a hammer curl. Uh, you're, you're working different muscles with those two different exercises. When it comes to supination, uh, the biceps is the primary supinator in most positions. Uh, if you're in full extension, it's not as active compared to the supinator. Um, which tends to be active when you are doing more unresisted supination exercises, such as say opening a, a you know a door. Um, if you think about if you really have to crank, if you have like a um, you know a jar that's very tough to open or something like that, where you have to really really uh, to force it, you tend to flex your elbow because that's when the biceps is given the most uh, mechanical advantage uh, for supination, as opposed to full extension. Biceps itself, uh, just basic anatomy, the long head and the short head proximally and where they attach, um, the innervation as well as the, the action is, is listed there. Uh, it inserts distally on the, the bicipital tuberosity, and we'll get into a little bit more on that. Uh, it has a short head and a long head, which uh, for the most part, people are familiar with proximally and, um, and the significance there. However, distally, there really is a short head and a long head too. Uh, however, in most people, these coalesce into a single tendon, but you can break it down from the contributions of each head. Uh, the short head does tend to insert slightly more distal, uh, whereas the long head tends to insert um, you know, farther away from the rotational axis, more ulnar and acts as a better supinator, whereas the short head acts as a more powerful flexor. Uh, and this can come into play with partial tears. Uh, again, separately, uh, more proximal in the elbow, distally, they combine and insert as one tendon. This can be seen on MRI. If you look more proximally in the elbow, you can see more discrete structures, a short head and a long head, uh, as you can see on these axial cuts. Um, slightly more distal, however, as they approach the, the radial tuberosity, they coalesce into a single tendon again in most, uh, in most people. Uh, the Lacertus fibrosis is an important structure to note. Uh, it's the bicipital aponeurosis arises from the short head and attaches uh, to the flexor tendon origin uh, over on the medial aspect of the elbow. It, um, it can remain intact when the biceps is torn and it can possibly be mistaken for an intact tendon uh, on physical exam. Um, so that's something to keep be aware of and it also can limit retraction proximally in certain cases. That's kind of a view of it on um, on cadaveric dissection, you can see the biceps on the left and the, the bicipital aponeurosis, the lacertus on the right. Um, again, presentation, mostly male, 40s and 50s, unexpected load, audible pop, pain in the antecubital fossa. These are the classic things that people will say when they come in to see you. Um, marked uh, weakness on supination, things like uh, screwing in a screwdriver, a door handle, um, as far as flexion goes, some patients will be more affected than others. So that's kind of variable. And then people will obviously report a deformity about their arm. On physical exam, um, you tend to see this ecchymosis in the antecubital fossa, uh, weakness with resisted supination. And you do see this, um, this what we call the reverse Popeye sign, uh, which is just to differentiate it from the classical Popeye sign with long head of the biceps ruptures proximally. Uh, just because it looks like the uh, the Popeye cartoon there for anyone who's familiar with that. Um, not always pronounced, though. Uh, if it's a partial tear, if there's an intact lacertus that limits retraction, uh, or potentially in the case of uh, body habitus being a factor, uh, you might not always see that reverse Popeye sign, so I wouldn't rely on that being present or not as a definitive uh, physical exam sign. The hook test, uh, the most popular, well-known test for this, uh, originally described by O'Driscoll. Um, and that is done with the elbow tend to be flexed to 90 degrees. Uh, the index finger hooks the lateral edge of the biceps tendon. Uh, if it's palpable, uh, that's a negative test. If it's not readily palpable, that's considered a positive test. And uh, the key thing with this is to really to compare it to the other side. I mean, that's something I've found in practice is that uh, that's the easiest way to know if, if it's kind of feeling the way it should or if it shouldn't. And, you know, they reported it as having 100% sensitivity and specificity. Um, it's a very good test. It's probably the best one for this. Um, I don't know about 100%, though. The squeeze test is another one that's reported, um, similar to the Thompson test for Achilles tendon injuries. You can squeeze the biceps um, and look for the uh, passive supination at the uh, at the forearm, just another test for kind of to confirm your, your diagnoses, because 
truthfully, a distal biceps rupture tends to be a clinical diagnosis. It's not really something that has to be made on, uh, on imaging. However, imaging is important, which we will get into shortly. So imaging, first off, plain radiographs is always the first uh, step, essentially with almost all orthopedic injuries. It's usually normal. Um, you can look for an avulsion or irregularity at the radial tuberosity, which um, may be important if there's a bony fragment that, that needs to be looked for uh, during surgery, um, but usually normal. MRI is uh, the gold standard for making a for making a um, imaging diagnosis, but again, it's not really necessary per se in most cases to make a clinical diagnosis, but it certainly can be helpful for uh, more chronic or retracted tears to get a better sense of where the tendon is located. Uh, if you're going to be doing surgery and you can measure kind of the distance from the, uh, from the radial tuberosity as far as that goes, uh, if you suspect a partial tear uh, or perhaps a myotendinous junction tear, uh, MRI is going to be very useful for that as well as your, uh, your decision making after a uh, special view that can be done is called this FABS view. It stands for flexion, abduction, supination. The patient's positioned in that way. And it's a, a really nice way to get a good look at the distal biceps tendon all the way down into its insertion on the tuberosity for uh, evaluation for suspected partial tears. Um, okay, looking at classification. Uh, there's not really any specific classification system for this. Uh, we tend to just describe it by whether it's partial or complete and then whether it's acute or chronic. Um, again, with partial tears, we can describe it based on the location of the partial tear, whether it's at the tuberosity or more proximally. These are all the important treatment uh, considerations, though, when you're, uh, you're going to think about how to treat these patients. Uh, surgical decision making uh, comes down to a lot of things. These kind of factors that I just mentioned, whether it's a partial or complete tear, acute or chronic, the location, how retracted is it. Uh, patient factors are probably the most important uh, in these cases. Um, I, Activity level, age, occupation, and what their expectations are for future uh, uh, use. Um, we'll go into some literature on what patients can expect with, um, you know, with non-operative management for this and what you can tell them. Uh, non-operative management nowadays, uh, at least in the United States, tends to be surgical for the most part. If it's non-operative, uh, it usually is someone who's low demand, maybe they're unfit for surgery, um, or if they have a strong preference to avoid surgery. Uh, you can expect a uh, loss of maybe 10 to 20 percent of flexion strength, 30 to 40 percent of supination strength, and that can even be worse if it's their dominant arm. Um, and even more so, it, they, they'll have a decreased upper extremity endurance for any sustained motions with either supination or flexion. And uh, these are average numbers um, that tended to come apart and in, in part due to this study where they looked at non-operative treatments um, and found these numbers uh, compared to uh, the surgically treated group. Uh, that being said, uh, interestingly enough, these the patients who did not have surgery, they did have overall satisfactory satisfactory functional outcomes and were able to return to work, albeit with these uh, limitations in strength. And if you look at this graph here, you can see that the patients actually did relatively well if you uh, just put stock into these functional outcome scores. So um, it is a viable option to treat to treat patients non-operatively. It's just important to explain these numbers to them, explain them what to ex expect because as we'll go into later with more chronic tears, you do have a little bit of a limited time window as far as getting this taken care of. It becomes a little more of an issue uh, if they delay down the line and then aren't happy. Uh, as far as operative treatment goes, uh, some considerations or perhaps controversies, if you will, as far as treatment goes. Uh, most people are familiar with the options for either a single or double incision, um, whether or not if you're doing a single incision, whether to do it longitudinal or transverse, as well as the type of fixation. So if you're doing a single incision uh, repair, uh, it's uh, anterior exposure only. It's done through this interval between the brachioradialis and pronator teres, or the Henry interval, if you will. Um, historically, uh, it was a high risk of nerve injury, whether the uh, LABCN or the posterior interosseous nerve. And the reason was the tendon had to be secured via drill holes in the radius when this was originally described, um, as opposed to the more modern fixation techniques that we have now. Therefore, a larger, in, you know, larger incision was needed, uh, deeper retractor placement. So historically, a much higher risk of nerve injury. Uh, much less dissection is required uh, nowadays with current fixation methods. So we see a lower nerve, uh, nerve injury rates. Uh, here's just an example of kind of the old uh, old school originally described incision for this versus 
uh, on the right where you can see modern techniques where we, we use a pretty, pretty small incision. Uh, the double incision is done with uh, an anterior and dorsal exposure uh, through the ECU dorsally. It was originally developed, developed uh, due to the complications we just described because of the excessive anterior dissection. We were trying to avoid that uh, by Boyd and Anderson in 1961. Uh, they also thought it to be a more anatomic repair. Um, as far as complication profiles, though, historically, uh, higher risk for radial ulnar stenostosis and heterotopic ossification. <clears throat> Part of this was due to the uh, nature of the approach, which I'll discuss briefly. Um, however, it's been modified since then in order to reduce these complications, and uh, today is relatively safe. Uh, this is the original approach done through essentially the Coker interval um, along the ulnar periosteum with those white arrows there on the right. The black arrows is the, uh, the modification, uh, Moray modification, and where most commonly this is um, done now. And uh, this is basically um, kind of how that uh, or why that modification was made. Uh, the current method on the left, you can see, is a uh, muscle splitting approach there, whereas before on the right, uh, you tended to follow the ulnar periosteum uh, around. And by violating that periosteum, then you put the patient at risk for heterotopic ossification and synostosis. That was the originally described <coughs> approach again through the Coker interval. but. Uh, now, by avoiding that ulnar periosteum, we avoid a lot of those complications. Uh, and this is just, again, showing if you're doing a double incision, you tend to be fixating it through uh, through drill holes and a, uh, and a trough. As far as fixation strategies go, uh, there's a lot um, that have all been done at various points uh, throughout the history of this surgery. Um, for a single incision, it originally was, again, noted to be done through drill holes in the radial tuberosity tied on the posterior surface. Again, that involved a large dissection with um, more nerve injuries. So that was um, <coughs> eventually abandoned in favor of more common modern fixation uh, techniques, such as the suture anchor repair, as well as uh, buttons and screws. Uh, and these were each kind of described successively in the 90s and 2000s. And uh, Mazaka described the screw and button technique. Uh, in 2005, um, and, and really not much has, has changed since then as far as uh, what type of fixation we use, although the instruments and everything have gotten more technologically uh, advanced and uh, made our lives easier for sure. Uh, an interference screw is also described <coughs> through a single incision um, as the only fixation method. Again, this isn't really uh, performed uh, much nowadays uh, due to the increased risk for fracture using a large screw as well as tunnel widening and tendon damage uh, from that insertion of the screw. Suture anchors, uh, there's again pros and cons, um, you know, smaller drill holes, smaller holes in the bone, uh, perhaps you maximize bone to tendon contact or surface area uh, with the tendon being at the surface of the bone. And um, one of the main ones, though, is that the far cortex doesn't need to be drilled, so you have a decreased PIN injury risk, hypothetically, so that might be a benefit of suture anchors, uh, as opposed to suspensory fixation with uh, various buttons. Um, the cortical window is made on the ulnar side of the tuberosity. The question is, is you know, do we use a, a screw with this or just a button alone? Uh, some proponents say that the uh, interference screw is, is better uh, for pullout strength versus uh, those proponents of the button alone, you know, say it's maybe just it's technically easier versus uh, having circumferential healing within the tendon. Uh, there is a risk to the PIN uh, with the beef pin that's passed through the uh, through the radius. Um, you can aim ulnar to try and avoid that. Uh, there's some newer techniques that, that don't involve a beef pin now that gets pulled out through the skin, uh, which can help avoid this PIN injury risk as well. Uh, bone tunnels, uh, this again, you know, outside of 50, 60 years ago is now done only for a two incision technique as opposed to a one incision technique. And again, proponents uh, think that maybe this is a more anatomic approach, which might be the reason for performing this one. As far as how do different techniques do as far as their strength in orthopedics, uh, you know, as we love to always test everything and see how strong everything is. So naturally that that study was performed in 2007 at AJSM. They used cadaveric specimens and they looked at cyclic loading as well as ultimate load to failure. Uh, four different techniques, bone tunnels, anchors, uh, button, as well as an interference group. And uh, as far as cyclic displacement, displacement goes, it uh, wasn't significant, statistically significant. <coughs> um, it looks like the bone tunnels uh, 
as well as the endo button or the, the button did, did better than the, uh, and the suture anchors and interference screw, but uh, but overall statistically uh, not significant. When it comes down to load to failure, however, the button did did the best. Uh, if you see that there, 440 newtons compared to the other ones where the uh, interference screw again um, performed the worst. And I think again that's part of the reason why not a lot of people out there are doing interference screw alone for their fixation. Uh, perhaps in addition to a button, but not as a standalone fixation. However, um, noting these numbers, again, uh, these Newtons, 440, 380, 310, 230, um, <clears throat> if you look at this study, they actually looked at the maximum eccentric force across the distal biceps for various physiologic activities throughout the day with various patients. And it turned out that for most people, the maximum stress across uh, the distal biceps was about 200 Newtons. So um, again, going back to all those other techniques, they all were above 200. So whether or not um, having 440 newtons of failure is necessary uh, to be determined, but um, but I just thought this was interesting to, to compare to. As far as outcomes, uh, obviously very important. How do uh, how do these patients do? So uh, naturally, there was a randomized clinical trial between single versus double incision techniques. Um, this was done in 2012 in JBJS. Uh, it was prospective randomized controlled trial, single incision uh, with suture anchors versus a double incision with drill holes. Uh, you can see the patient characteristics over there. All of them were male, uh, their 40s and 50s, dominant arm. Um, and as you might expect, uh, there was no difference as far as final outcome scores go. And with regards to all these uh, endpoints, uh, two incision demonstrated slightly increased flexion strength, which was interesting, uh, 104%, so it was actually stronger than the uh, the contralateral side, uh, as opposed to the one incision showing a higher incidence of um, uh, lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve neuropraxia, which again is something that you would, you would expect, <clears throat> but overall functionally no difference. Uh, and this is an interesting study that just makes you think a little bit about um, single incision versus double incision, a lot of proponents uh, tend to say the double incision gives you a better um, kind of more anatomic repair. It allows you to recreate that wraparound effect of the distal biceps tendon attaching to the radial tuberosity and looked at the, this paper looked at the supination torque um, in single versus double incision repairs in different elbow positions. Um, and interestingly, the single incision actually restored supination torque uh, slightly better than uh, the <laughs> than the double incision, it was only clinically significant at 60, uh, 60 degrees of supination, but uh, but still better in all the uh, all the other ones other than uh, 45 degrees pronated, which looks like it was about uh, about the same. Um, why uh, they postulated that perhaps with a dorsal approach, there's some damage to the supinator muscle, which might play a factor in this. But again, important to know range of motion, clinical outcomes, all are essentially uh, similar between between groups. Complication profiles, again, kind of going into this, uh, when it comes to single incision, you know, nerve injury, nerve injury, nerve injury, that's kind of the complication profile for that. Um, you obviously want to keep the forearm maximally supinated while performing that surgery in order to move the posterior interosseous nerve away from the surgical field, and that's been described in the literature as well. Uh, heterotopic ossification is, is not as common as opposed to double incisions. Again, historically higher rates, but with newer techniques and the boring modification for uh, the dorsal approach, it's much lower. Um, and again, you know, you wanna make sure you're irrigating away any bony debris that you're doing for either surgery. Um, and some, some surgeons will actually utilize endomethacin as a prophylaxis after, after these cases to prevent that. <laughs> this is a meta-analysis that looked at the complications. Um, Again, just kind of more, um, more evidence to kind of what we already expect, a single incision, uh, neuropraxia being the most common complication, double incision, heterotopic dislocation being the most common complication. So just something to, to keep aware of uh, if you're kind of deciding which, which approach to do. Um, and here's just a graph there, just showing on the left side of that um, uh, table there, the double incision HO is squarely in that category, whereas for the single incision, uh, the neuropraxias and nerve complications are, are are more common with that with that technique. Uh, so naturally, that leads to pros and cons of single incision versus double incision. Single incision is small; uh, it's a cosmetic incision. Um, there's a lot of industry-specific fixation options that make this very uh, straightforward and a lot less challenging technically. Uh, cons: perhaps it's less anatomic. Uh, 
Uh, and you do have to do a deeper exposure uh, to expose the tuberosity from anteriorly, which puts you at risk for, uh, for nerve injury as opposed to the double incision, um, which you know, perhaps again, some may argue that it's more anatomic, whether or not that's borne out in the literature is debatable. Um, less injury to the nerve, uh, decreased cost since this is done through drill, drill holes and a trough as opposed to implants, um, perhaps less cosmetic with two injury, with two, with two scars. So the bottom line, uh, lots of studies, pros and cons of each options. There's really no definitive evidence for superiority of one technique versus the other. And obviously uh, do what you're comfortable with and when performed correctly, uh, you can have successful outcomes and low complication rates with any of these techniques. So uh, now we'll go into partial tears <coughs> and how to treat those. So partial tears, they really can be described as either insertional or myotendinous. Uh, that picture at the top there is a, is a partial myotendinous rupture <coughs> that actually presented to me a few weeks ago. Um, the presentation is actually very similar. Uh, it's an eccentric load, felt to pop, weakness. <coughs> but really, this is where the physical exam comes into play. The uh, hook test would be negative uh, with an intact palpable tendon and uh, theoretically no Popeye deformity. Um, for me, I mean, having MRI readily available where I practice, we're a little bit spoiled for sure. Um, we tend to get an MRI in these cases, um, and that's really the diagnostic uh, imaging modality of choice uh, to just show whether or not there's a partial tear or a full tear with maybe uh, you know, an intact lacertus limiting retraction, and then that'll hopefully guide our surgical decision-making. As far as treatment goes, um, there's really no single accepted algorithm. If you look uh, deeply into this, uh, there's some literature that says a large percentage of partial tears will have poor outcomes or go on to need surgery. Uh, but again, that's just a little variable. Traditionally, if you look at um, you know some of the textbooks and everything, it, it'll say you know fix it if it's 50% torn or more, uh, take it down and repair it versus less than 50% at least uh, trial non-operative management. And my, my approach, it doesn't, I don't really take into account the 50% rule so much. I, I you know, tend to take it on a patient by patient basis, uh, age, occupation, hand dominance, degree of symptoms, as well as their tolerance of failure. And that's an important one, in my opinion, to discuss with patients about uh, their job, their expectations, and whether or not they're okay with maybe six to 12 weeks of non-operative management, and then potentially having residual symptoms and needing to go on to surgery. And if they're okay with that, then absolutely. I think it's very appropriate to trial non-operative management, but some patients will say, Hey, you know, I can't take off work for six to 12 weeks and then have surgery if, uh, you know, if I'm not recovering appropriately. So they may want to go right to, to surgery in that case. And which is also very reasonable given the literature. So this is something to keep in mind as well. Now, I know we talked about uh, the distal insertion and how there's a short head and a long head, but they tend to be one tendon. <clears throat> in certain individual, it has been described in the literature that they might have a bifid distal biceps insertion. Um, it's been described that it might occur in up to 25% of individuals, hard to say whether that's for sure. And what you can see is actually a selective rupture of the short head. Um, as far as why the short head tends to be the one that it always happens to, uh, I don't think that's been worn out completely. But um, the key is, is that it can really mimic a high grade partial or a full thickness tear clinically. Uh, where you have maybe a reverse Popeye deformity due to retraction of one of the heads, but a negative or equivocal hook test. Um, and MRI can be confusing as well because you can actually see both uh, a retracted tendon as well as an intact tendon. And uh, this can you know, confuse you or confuse a radiologist or, or the reports um, if you're not familiar with this anatomic variant, which is a little more, more common than I think most people would, would uh, you know, be led to believe. Uh, so it's been described um, in the literature, not a ton, but there's been a few case reports. Um, if you look proximally and the MRI in this case, you can see a short head that's thickened and retracted with a normal looking long head. Um, and then a little bit more distally, you can still see a long head visualized, but the short head is actually absent in these cases. And again, you can see this on the axial cut there, a short head that's thickened and retracted and balled up. Um, and then on the... Um, you know, sagittal sequence, you can see the, uh, the long head actually inserting into the tuberosity. So it's a bit of a confusing scenario and you might not know what, you know, what exactly is going on if you're not as familiar with this. So something to, to keep a, an eye out for because it's a confusing clinical picture as well. 
Uh, here's just another demonstration there on the left of that balled up tendon there. But also if you scroll a few more sequences or a few more cuts, you see the, the tendon going and inserting all the way. So um, you're going to have kind of symptoms and signs of both. Um, here's one actually that uh, presented to me actually uh, about a month ago um, at the tuberosity. You can clearly see a, a distal biceps insertion, but a little bit more proximally. Uh, or you can see on the on the left image, you can see insertion <coughs> as well as a torn and um, retracted tendon stump. Uh, slightly more proximally, you can kind of see the reconstitution of both heads. And um, again, it just might be a, a confusing clinical scenario. As far as what to do with these, if you do come across one, uh, there's not a ton of uh, data or literature out there. This was just three cases that of this, and and you know what they did in two cases, they repaired uh, both heads independently. Uh, with anchors in one case, they selectively repaired the short head. Um, I think anything is really, you can pretty much choose any of these approaches in this case, whether or not you want to take down the uh, intact tendon and tubularize it with the other one and reinsert it as one or selectively repair. Um, any of those options would be, would be acceptable. Uh, going into chronic tears, um, not nearly as common, but can be somewhat of a challenging clinical scenario. Um, they can be defined as, uh, if you look at various papers or various literature, anywhere from four to 12 weeks or more, um, obviously they're gonna present with continued weakness as well as a cosmetic deformity. And if you look at the MRI in this case, you're gonna see significant retraction of the biceps. Again, these are MRIs from a case of mine. Um, you'll see fatty atrophy of the biceps itself due to the disuse over, uh, in this case, the patient was actually uh, over a year out, um, as well as compensatory hypertrophy of the brachialis, which now has to step in and you know pretty much be uh, have a bigger role with, with regards to elbow flexion now that the biceps is, uh, is non-functional. As far as treatment, that's kind of where the uh, where the issue lies. Um, often these patients are very unhappy um, because they maybe initially chose to have non-operative management, or maybe they're in a scenario where they just presented late, um, but they have continued weakness, continued cramping, continued um, not usually as much pain, but just dysfunction that's limiting them from perhaps their job or their hobbies or, or daily activities that they want to do. Um, and direct repair is often not possible uh, given the amount of retraction, scar formation, um, the neurovascular structures, uh, brachial arteries right there. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, it's really not possible to just kind of through a incision, just reach up there, grab it and pull it down. Um, there has been described a tenodesis to the brachialis as a surgical treatment for this, which is a very safe and um, can be effective uh, technique, but um, it really is more to decrease pain and cramping. Um, by, um, by putting some tension on the biceps, it really won't restore that supination strength and endurance, which I think is the biggest complaint that these people will come in uh, saying that they just, when they're twisting or doing certain things, twisting a screwdriver, a door, a, a top, they're just really unhappy about it. So the question then comes down to how to treat these. Um, really, the, it seems like the preferred technique that's come about is really a reconstruction. Uh, it tends to be described with allograft, although Obviously, allografts aren't readily available, um, you know, in every country. So obviously, autograph could be used as well. And if you look at the outcomes, um, again, there's not a ton of literature just because it's not a very common procedure. But <clears throat> this was probably one of the largest uh, case series uh, that was uh, described. 18 patients all having allograft reconstructions, and they had good outcomes. Um, with a mean follow-up of 21 months, they had full range of motion, a pretty good supination and flexion strength, 4.7 out of 5, but, but not full functional outcome scores that were good. Um, but uh, it's important to note that 17 out of 18 patients still had a cosmetic deformity in the arm. And that's just something that if you're ever kind of undertaking one of these cases, uh, it's not like with acute tears where you can really um, reverse that uh, because of the degree of retraction and how long it's been that way, the biceps tends to kind of uh, maintain that reverse Popeye or atrophied uh, defor uh, deformity despite the um, potentially restoring the, the tendon and uh, supination strength. So my technique for these, uh, I use an Achilles allograft. Um, if I'm going to undertake one of these, I, I just like the graft because uh, it kind of comes to that more, um, that coalesces into a tendon that can be fixed distally and then it flares out proximally and that gives you nice fixation throughout the biceps muscle belly where there's not as strong fixation. I like to fix it distally with a cortical button through a single anterior uh, incision, kind of like if you were just doing an acute uh, single incision distal biceps rupture, I mark out a full incision. Um, but I don't often use it. Um, 
the next step is to isolate the briceps proximally, uh, release adhesion circumferentially. So you really need good exposure for this. Um, there's usually lots of adhesions, again, more danger along the medial aspect of the biceps where the neurovascular bundle is. I uh, then utilize uh, blunt dissection to create a pathway. Again, uh, this is where you got to decide if, if there's a pathway and you can follow it and it makes sense and it's where it needs to go, then this is acceptable just to pass a clamp from proximal to distal and tunnel it proximally. However, um, I do have a low threshold. I'd like to not do it if I don't have to, but a low threshold to open up and make a full antecubital uh, exposure. So then you'll, you'll tunnel the graft proximally and then uh, basically utilize the, you know, uh, suture, uh, locking suture technique of your choice. I use a crack house suture to drape the graft over the biceps, uh, trim it to length, and then and suture it into the biceps. And that's why I like the Achilles because it gives you that nice flare, uh, allows you to drape it nicely over the biceps. Um, and one thing that's not, you can't really see in this picture is, is um, <clears throat> what I tend to do is make a small window in the flare of the graft, um, kind of where the distal bicep or the bicep stump lines up with. And I pull the biceps uh, through the graft, basically pulling distally at the same time as pulling the graft proximally. And that kind of sets the tension well, while maybe an assistant will hold that position. And then while you, while you suture it. And uh, again, that's a, another reason why I think the Achilles is, uh, is nice. Uh, you can do kind of a, a technique like that as opposed to maybe doing a full <coughs> pulver tapped weave or something along those lines with other grafts. Um, technical pearls. Uh, again, I like to fix it distally first. You certainly don't have to. I think it just makes it easier as far as trimming and setting the tension if you're uh, set distally and then you can kind of trim off some of that flare that you don't need proximally even after you've already sutured it in as opposed to uh, having to either guess or dunk in kind of a, a lot more of the tendon than you really want to into the distal hole. Um, spend a lot of time releasing the adhesions proximally. Um, having excursion of the muscle belly itself is going to be key to allowing that biceps to function um, you know, normally. Um, if it's still scarred in place, then it's really not going to be able to, to, to have excursion and give, give that flexion and supination that you want to restore. Uh, you set the tension 45 to 60 degrees, maximally supinated again. And again, I like to pass the native stump through a window in the flare of the graft with the assistant simultaneously pulling uh, the graft proximally, the biceps distally. I wish I had a good picture of that to show, but I think that allows you then to set the tension exactly how you want it. They hold it in place, you suture it, and then, um, and, you know, and then you're done. Um, and you should do this with the tourniquet down, obviously, when setting the tension and suturing proximally so that you don't mistakenly think you have more, uh, more tension than you do. And then uh, that's all I have. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Garrett, for this uh, comprehensive presentation. Garrett, you can stop sharing. Uh, thank you, Garrett, for this uh, very comprehensive presentation. You covered the entire spectrum of uh, distal biceps tendon injuries. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks uh, for let's, me. Have, let's have a short QA. Yeah. Uh, Garrett, what is your preferred technique in distal biceps? Is it a single incision or a two incision technique? In your, in your yeah. personal. Yeah, my, my, my technique is, is a single incision. I just, I find it just to be, uh, just to be easier, more straightforward. Um, obviously we're very spoiled here with the various techniques for fixation options that we have with, um, the buttons and, and screws and whatnot. I just technically, I think it, it it's more straightforward. So you use uh, suture anchors as your implant choice or buttons? Uh, actually I use a button. I use a, uh, cortical button on the, uh, dorsal cortex, um, with no screw. And uh, Gad, interestingly, I was just looking at some of the data on uh, distal biceps, and someone has published on a intramedullary button. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you've checked into that. Yeah, I, I, I'm aware of it. I haven't tried it. I think I, I like the idea of not having to drill all the way through. Um, again, you know, the, that's the one thing every, you know, PIN injury, that's, you know, if you, if, if you don't have that, you're happy. Um, so I would, I would certainly be interested to kind of look into that more for sure. It's a, it's a great option. And uh, Gad, you mentioned about uh, getting the maximum tension at uh, 45 degrees, right? 45 to 60 degrees. Yeah. And uh, uh, the arm and supination? Yes. Okay. Does it vary between the single versus double incision? Um, so, so that technique was really just for when I'm doing these reconstructions. Um, if I'm doing an acute rupture, I will set the tension kind of how it lies. I mean, 
I'll try and I'll just put it kind of put it in where it where it's supposed to go. I mean, you can accept up to 90 degrees of flexion uh, when you're fixing these. Um, if you're doing maybe a subacute or, or an early chronic tear, but um, as far as that goes, I'll just set the tension where it where it lies. And uh, imagine someone was doing an interference screw fixation, right? For example, when you do an ACL reconstruction, we say that I mean you secure the tibial side with the knee in 30 degree flexion, right? and uh, preferably like an internal patient. So what is, suppose someone wants to do an interference fixation for the distal biceps. So what is the angle that you would recommend? Well, if, there, if you're doing interfer interference fixation, I mean, theoretically, you might want to think about putting the screw more radial to push the, push the tendon more ulnarly just to try and get your maximum supination uh, moment uh, there. Um, uh, otherwise, again, I, I don't, angle-wise, I aim a little bit distal and ulnar, uh, just to, again, try and avoid the, the PIN as that's been described, but um, there's, I don't really have any other factors that I take into play there. The position of the arm, does it matter, the elbow flexion? Um, once you've kind of drilled your tunnel for the interference fit, I don't think it really matters for the, for the elbow flexion. Again, I'm just gonna flex the elbow to where it's necessary to try and um, set the tension correctly without without over-tensioning it, obviously, but um, you know where it anatomically is gonna lie uh, for acute repairs. I, I don't know you, if you Ed. know any other uh, literature on that. But... No, I'm not sure, that's why I asked you. Uh, thank you, Garrett. Uh, Garrett, we also joined by Loy. Loy is an orthopedic and sports medicine surgeon based in Dubai. Loy, welcome to the show. Any questions to Garrett, please? Thanks, uh, thanks again for the presentation. I think you answered most of the questions actually. One of the comments maybe, uh, would you would you fix the distal biceps in uh, an inflection and leave it in a tight flexion that you, you can, would be face some difficulties while you extend it? Because at the end it will it will stretch out mm -hmm. without, even without using uh, the allograft. Yes, absolutely. So if, it is possible to uh, to fix it without going past 90 degrees of flexion. That is the optimal fixation, in my opinion, as opposed to augmenting it with an, with an allograft. If it if you can't get I mean, usually it's it's kind of a there's this borderline, whether it's four or six weeks, kind of how you when you're still able to do that. But um, absolutely, I think you can fix it up to 90 degrees of flexion. Beyond that, it's a little questionable whether or not you should augment. Uh, but that's kind of an interoperative decision. It will exactly. Out. This is the message that I want to deliver. If, if, exactly. It will stretch out. This is for my young colleagues. And with the first, I would say the first six to eight weeks, you can still fix it in up to 90 degrees. And you yeah, just don't splint it, don't, uh, don't brace it, and go immediately with the active uh, and active assisted uh, flexion that will stretch out over time. It takes up to two months, actually, to go back to near full extension. Absolutely. It's actually really impressive how these things stretch out and you can be really tight <laughs> the day of surgery, 90 <laughs> degrees even. And then, yeah, like you said, a couple months later, six, eight weeks later, they got full motion. So it's, yeah, yeah, absolutely acceptable. Uh, we got, uh, regarding the uni, uh, unicortical button technique, I tried it uh, or used it in Germany. I, I haven't found any difference actually between the end of button, the, uh, the technique and the unicortical technique. Or the same, I'm not sure. I, what, I followed up the patient for about 12 months there, but I, I didn't find any difference. We'll mm -hmm. see. Yeah, um, I, go ahead. Oh, I was just saying, yeah, good, good, to, good to hear that. You know, that you had a good result. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think that's all the comments or the questions that we have for tonight. Thank you, Garrett. Uh, uh, we'll leave Garrett because he has a, he has a clinic Thank you, Garrett, as well for this. Catch. Uh, very yes. comprehensive presentation, and I'm sure this is going to benefit a lot of people all over the world, Garrett. Thank you so much for joining. I hope so. I appreciate you having me. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Thanks, Garrett. Take care. Bye. Take care.